Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Planetarium with Pacific Science Center. Welcome back to those of you who have been here before. My name is Marissa, and today we're going to be talking about stars. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the constellations you can see tonight um, and tell a couple of stories. And then co-hosting with me today is Adrian. Adrian, do you want to introduce yourself and what you'll be talking about? Yeah, well, yeah, my name is Adrian, and I'll be talking about specifically the Mayan star culture, a lot of things Mayans discovered hundreds of years ago, and some of their stories, and I'll share those with you today. Fantastic. So let's get going. Oh, one more thing for those of you who haven't come around to one of our virtual planetarium shows before, um, you should notice a live chat box up in the corner. Um, because this is a live show, we are here to answer any questions you might have during it. So if you have a question, go ahead and type it into that chat box and uh, we will try to answer it if we can. All right. Um, if we don't answer your question, feel free to add it in the comments below the video later on, and we'll try to get an answer to you later. Now, let's get going. I'm going to share my screen. Do, do, do. There we go. So you should all be able to see a field right now. Uh, right now, the coordinates for this are set uh, in Seattle. As you can see, the picture was not taken in Seattle. It was taken in a field somewhere, I think somewhere in France, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, and right overhead, we can see the sun because right now we are looking at the sky in the daytime. But this is a show about the sky in the nighttime. So I'm going to do something we can only do with planetarium software, and that is fast forward through time. We're going to let that sun start to sink. It looks like the sun is moving across the sky, but it is in fact our planet that moves. Our planet spins around and the sun shines on different parts of it. There we go. And right now it's going to go shine on the other side. And we're going to see that nighttime sky. And I'm going to pause right about there. So looking up right now, we can see the moon. I'm circling the moon right now with my uh, cursor. If we go up a little bit, we can see the names of a few different stars. If we look over to the side here, we can see Jupiter right at the horizon. Um, right now, it's set for about midnight, exactly. So right at midnight, Jupiter and Saturn are going to start to come up um, sort of to the southeast. And if you stay up real late tonight, you should be able to see them. I'm going to move us over this way. Here we go, because I want to point out a few groups of stars here. So I always like to start out my shows by pointing out the first group of stars I ever learned how to find, uh, and that is straight ahead right here. It is a group of seven stars in the shape of a long-handled ladling spoon. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, a group of stars you might know by the name of the Big Dipper. Now, um, this is part of a larger constellation. If we add these stars down here, and these stars over here and these stars over here, it starts to take shape as something different. Um, I'm going to bring up some lines to connect those dots and help you see it. There's a lot of lines up, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this guy. There we go. So um, I always like to ask people what this looks like. Um, I've heard folks say it looks like a frog or like a headless pirate is waving and has a peg leg. Um, but many, many different cultures across the world have seen this as a bear. Um, here's the legs of the bear, here's the head of the bear, and here is the bear's tail. And the Greeks called it Ursa Major, the big bear. I bring up some pictures here, you can see it a little bit better. Now you might notice something kind of funny about this bear. Um, it's got bear paws, bear face, bear tail, Although this tail is looking a little bit different from other bears. It's got a big, long, fluffy tail. Um, and if you look over to the side here, the Little Dipper uh, is another bear with another really long tail. There's a lot of stories to explain why this bear might have big, long, fluffy tail. Um, I know in the Greek story, they got picked up by the tail and swung around a couple times, and then thrown up in the sky, and that stretched their tails out. And I'm going to turn that picture off here. What I want to do is get us all sort of oriented to know where we are right now in um, in space, help us sort of find our bearings. Um, so a great way to find your bearings is to start with a Big Dipper, and then you can use it to find a very special star. 
I mentioned earlier that our planet moves. We're facing different parts of space at different times of the night or day. Um, but, and because of that, the stars appear to move across the sky, but there's one star that does not move. It stays put. Um, the very tip of our planet, the North Pole, is tilted towards it, um, always towards the same direction. So because of that, that star stays in the same spot. They call that the North Star or Polaris, if you want to use the fancy name. And you can find Polaris by using the Big Dipper. So uh, what I want us to do is look at these two stars right here, Merrick and Doobie. Those are their names. Um, and you can draw a line from Merrick and Doobie straight ahead. It's about five of these spaces, the spaces between Merrick and Doobie, five of those spaces away. One, two, three, four, five, more or less. And that right there is the North Star, the very tip of the tail of the Little Dipper. So if you found the North Star, you found the Little Dipper. Awesome. So now I'm going to move us a little bit. I want to show a few more constellations on the other side here. Uh, here we go. In the spring, there are a few uh, major constellations that you can spot um, using the Big Dipper. Once again, I want to start with the Big Dipper. So here's the tail now of the Big Dipper. And if we sort of arc from that tail over this way, we reach the star Arcturus. So what I always like to say is you arc to Arcturus. And Arcturus is part of a larger constellation the Greeks called Bootes, um, or Bootes, Bootes. I never quite know how to say it. Um, here's the lines here. Here's the picture. As you can see, Bootes is a guy holding a sickle and a spear thing. Um, I believe he was put in the sky, according to the Greeks, because he invented the plow or something, and that was like a, a, um, a reward as you get put up in the sky. I've noticed that the Greeks um, like to say that all of these people got put in the sky most of the time by Zeus, and for a lot of different reasons. So Zeus's sort of solution to every problem is to throw people up in the sky. Um, for the bear, it was a punishment. Um, for Bootes, it was a reward. Um, for a lot of other people, it's a lot of other different things got a problem, stick them up in the sky, according to Zeus. Uh, let's turn off these right here. There we go. Um, so you can arc to Arcturus from there. Um, you can speed on to Spica. So once you draw that line from the tail of the Big Dipper over to Arcturus, then you just kind of go down in a straight line to Spica, which is another star, part of another constellation called Virgo. Let's bring up that picture real quick. Um, Virgo is what the Greeks called her. Many different cultures associated her with a, a harvest goddess or fertility goddess. Um, the idea is when Virgo is up in the sky, it is time to plant your crops. That means it is springtime and uh, time to get those plants in the ground. You can see she's holding some wheat right here, right there. All right, hey, Adrian, how are we doing on time? So uh, we are, you've got about 12 minutes. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, I've got 12 minutes or I've been talking for 12 minutes. You've got 12 minutes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep going then. Um, as we move over this way, we see the moon right here. I wanted to focus on this constellation right here. This is one um, that is down close to the horizon, so it might be a little bit harder to spot. Um, let's bring up the lines here. This one right here, we can only see about half of it, but I really like to point out this constellation um, because it's one that you know if you've seen the movie Moana at all. Um, the Greeks called this constellation Scorpius, the scorpion. And if I bring up the picture, that's what you'll see. You'll see the front part of a scorpion. But if we turn off the land for a second here so we can see the bottom, if you notice this sort of hook part right here, um, the Polynesian people call that Maui's hook, Maui's fish hook. So if you remember in Moana, Maui's fish hook, there it is right there in the sky or it's the tail of the scorpion right there. All right, let's bring the land back. I find when I get rid of the land, I lose all bearing. Okay, so just to go over what we've learned so far, we found the Big Dipper. With that, we found Ursa Major, the Big Bear. 
when we draw a line from this part of the Big Dipper straight over this way, we find the North Star, which is part of the Little Dipper. And then if we, if we go in the opposite direction, if we draw a line from the tail, we can arc to Arcturus and then speed on to Spica. Now, if we go underneath the bear, sort of this way, we find another constellation. I'm going to zoom in on it. I can always find it by its backward question mark head and its triangle tail. Um, a lot of people say this looks like a mouse, which I can really see. Um, I really have to bring up the picture to see what the Greeks thought it was, which is a lion, the lion Leo. Um, his face is kind of disappearing behind that bush right there. Let's get rid of the land again. There we go. The lion Leo. Now, similar to Ursa Major, the big bear, um, this is another one of those constellations that was seen as a lion by totally separate cultures. It's really cool. Some of these constellations um, have been seen as the same animal by cultures that didn't interact, that are totally different parts of the world. And some anthropologists think that's because these constellations are so old that they go back to when these separate groups of people came from the same place. Really, really, really old uh, pictures in the sky. Um, here is Leo right here. Underneath that, you can see Regulus is sort of the bright star in it. Um, there's an Arabian story that involves Leo. I'm gonna take away these stars real quick. Um, and the re Arabian story um, involves a gazelle, and it uses these three groups of stars, these two right here, these two right here, and these two right here. They're sort of the, the toes of the, um, of the big bear. And according to the story, there was a gazelle that was drinking at a pool of water. And the pool of water is this group of smaller stars uh, right above Leo. So the gazelle was drinking at the water, and then a lion laying nearby lashed its tail back and forth, and that scared the gazelle. So it leaped up in the air, and it landed three times. One, two, three, and then it dashed away. So these groups of stars here are called the three leaps of the gazelle. I know there's a story I wanted to tell about Arcturus that I forgot to mention earlier, so I'm going to jump back real quick. Um, so the Greeks called this constellation Buotes. And right now, all the constellations we're seeing, uh, or many of these constellations we're seeing, um, the names come from the ancient Greeks. Um, but there's a quick story I wanted to tell about this star right here, the star Arcturus, one of my favorite stories about it, um, that comes from the Lummi tribe, which is a tribe of native, native people from the Pacific Northwest. And they say that this star right here isn't Arcturus. This star right here um, belongs to a character called Coyote, who uh, shows up in a lot of native folklore, uh, native stories. Um, and in this story, Coyote has this party trick he likes to do where he pops out his eyeballs and he juggles them. And one day he was popping out his eyeballs to juggle them as a party trick, and he threw one too high up in the sky, and it got stuck up there. And that is the star right here, Arcturus. It's Coyote's eyeball. I like that story a lot. All right, oh, let's bring the land back so we can see where we are. Fantastic. So we've got Leo, we've got Scorpius or Maui's fish hook. Um, we've got the big bear, we've got the little bear. Uh, we've got Buotes, we've got Virgo. Now there's one more thing I wanted to talk about. I'm gonna fly us over to the other side over here. Excellent. Um, this is a group of stars that are going to become more prominent over the next couple months. So as we go into summer, um, these stars will be easier and easier to spot. And they are called the Summer Triangle. They are three stars. Um, they're all part of separate constellations, um, but you can draw a nice giant triangle across the sky by connecting those dots. And they're all labeled right here as well, which makes it a bit easier to see them in this software. In space, they are not actually labeled. Um, their names are Deneb, Vega, and Altair. And as you can see, connecting the dots here, they paint a nice big triangle that we call the Summer Triangle. Now, many of us live in places where there is a lot of light. 
Um, many of the stars you're seeing right now are hard to spot um, if you're living anywhere close to a city with a lot of lights. So I always like to say that to find a constellation, you don't have to find all of those dim stars in it connecting the dots. All you have to find is the brightest star. If you have found the brightest star, you have found that constellation and you can tell your friends you found that constellation. Um, so if you can find the Summer Triangle, which I've been able to see in Seattle um, on, a, on a, a not cloudy night, um, which is sometimes rare to find in Seattle. Um, if you can find these stars, you have found three whole constellations. Uh, I'm going to bring up those lines again so you can see what those constellations are. Um, if you found Deneb, then you found the constellation Cygnus, the big swan. A cool thing about Cygnus, I believe the first black hole that was discovered um, was right next to this constellation, sort of right in this area here. Um, if you found Vega, you found the constellation Lyra, the harp. And if you found Altair, then you found the eagle, whose name I always forget. So I'm going to cheat really quick and I'm going to bring up the label. Aquila, the eagle, there it is. Uh, it's always okay to look things up if you can't remember them. And if I bring up the pictures here, you can get a better picture of them. There's Cygnus the Swan. There's Lyra the Harp. And there's Aquila the Eagle. Three whole constellations. All right, so we've spent a lot of time looking at Greek constellations, uh, ones that you might be more familiar with, but I am going to pass this off to Adrian uh, so he can talk about Mayan star culture. I think it's so important to remember that just because the Greeks said that these uh, stars made made these pictures and gave them these names um, doesn't mean that everybody thought that. There have been many, many, many cultures across the world who all looked at the same stars and found different pictures in them. Uh, so, Adrian, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass it over to you. All right, great. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I've got going on on my screen over here. Great. So, um, above all else, the Mayans liked to track how the sun would move. They would... Uh, they had very specific buildings that would find out where the sun would rise on certain days and where it would rise uh, other parts of the year. Now, we're going to watch this on a very specific day because the Mayans got so good at tracking how the sun moves across the sky. Let's actually take a look at that really quick. So you see this line right here? That is called the ecliptic. And that is how the sun, the moon, and all planets travel across the sky. They all go across this line and the Mayans nailed down how this would move. They got so good at tracking the sun that they also were able to track a very specific event. So let's advance time and see if we can figure out what's going on here. Great. So you can probably start to notice it right here. There's some kind of object here. I want you to make a guess about what that might be. And you see this object is going right in front of the sun. Huh, how interesting. And then it starts to get darker. And look at that. So you may have uh, guessed that this object that's passing in front of, uh, that's, all, that's passing in front of the sun is the moon. This is what we call an eclipse. An eclipse happens when three objects are in alignment. Now, in this case, our three objects are the sun, the moon, and earth. Right now, the moon is between the sun and the earth and blocking out a lot of the light that we would get from the sun, typically. Uh, but the, the moon is blocking it out. And the Mayans got very, very good at predicting events like this. I want you to imagine, it's hundreds of years ago. We know a lot about eclipses nowadays. We have a solar eclipse. That's when the sun is blocked out by the moon. We have a lunar eclipse. That's when the moon has its light blocked out by Earth from the sun. That's when the moon gets darker. But this is when the sun gets darker. This is a solar eclipse. Lunar eclipse is when the moon gets darker because Earth's shadow is blocking it out. Um, but imagine it's hundreds of years ago. You don't know anything about eclipses. You don't know that it's caused by the moon. 
like suddenly it gets dark, the birds start freaking out, it gets a little bit colder. Um, how would that feel? How would that make you feel? It would be pretty scary. Um, so it would freak out a lot of ancient civilizations like Chinese civilizations and a Mayan civilization. So the Mayans got very good at predicting events like this so they could plan when they would be scared. Now, if we keep going, you can see eventually the sun will come back. There's our ground, getting more light. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what the Mayans saw in their nighttime sky. So there goes the sun dipping below the horizon. Great, awesome. All right, so if you look closely at the stars, it's not as obvious as I want it to be. Let's turn that up. So if you look closely at the stars, you'll notice that they're twinkling. See that star's twinkling, that one's twinkling. But then, hang on. We've got a couple things here that are not twinkling. Make a guess about what those could be. We've got the stars that twinkle, and then we've got a couple things that aren't twinkling. What could they be? They are planets. This one right here is Venus, and this one over here is Mars. Um, now, in addition to tracking the sun across the sky, the Mayans also got very good at tracking these planets across the sky. Remember our ecliptic? The sun and the moon follow this path, but the planets do as well. Now, the Mayans got very good at tracking particularly Venus and Mars a little bit, but let's see how they move across the sky. Let's just go day by day and see what we notice. So keep your eye on one of these two, Venus or Mars, pick your favorite. Let's go day by day. And there's the moon, the moon's going across that line too. You'll notice, and we've got a couple more planets, that the planets are moving across the sky. Now, think about how long it would take for a planet to go all the way across the sky, all the way around, and end up right back in the same position. That would take a really long time. Do you think it varies with the planets? Do you think that they all take the same amount of time? How long do you think that would take? It would take a really long time, right? So it depends on the planet. Venus takes about 583.83 days to get all the way across the sky and right back in the same spot. And the Mayans got pretty close to this number. They calculated it as 584 days, which is as close as you can get without decimals. And they didn't have decimals. So that was pretty close. They also got good. Hey, Adrian. Mars. Yeah, they also got really good at tracking Mars across the sky as well. Now, Mars had something a little different going on here. So let's actually focus on Venus again and go day by day. So you notice that they're all moving in one direction. They're going this way. They're going like higher and higher in the sky. But let's look at this. Let's turn off the atmosphere so you can see this going because the sun's gonna come up. Now look at Venus. Mars is still going that way. These two planets are going backwards because they're actually orbiting around the sun. We used to think they orbited around Earth, but now we know they orbit around the sun. That's Venus and that's Mercury. So to account for when Mars would move backward in the sky, Mars apparently moves backward in the sky as well. So to account for that, um, they had a long count and a short count for Mars. Mars's short count for how long it takes to get all the way across the sky and all the way back, it's about 760 days. Mars's long count for when it does move backward in the sky and takes up more time is about 800 days. And that's a, that's a pretty good average. Mars uh, takes about 780 days to get all the way across the sky. It takes longer, it takes a lot longer when it moves backward in the sky, like Mercury and Venus are doing. But uh, yeah, they got pretty close at those counts as well. 
And in particular, hey, Adrian. Yeah. I've got an audience question for you. Um, they're wondering if the Mayans used any special ancient devices to help predict things. Hmm. So not in particular. This was all basically observational astronomy. They just, they didn't have Netflix. They didn't have television. They didn't have Zoom. They didn't have any of that. So a lot of what they did is just look at stars across the sky. And they noticed patterns over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, it took a while for them to figure this all out, but they just kept looking at the stars, noticing how they moved. Notice that some of them move a little differently and they got really good at it over the years. This was also how they would tell stories. So uh, speaking of stories, let's talk about how the sun down here and the moon were created. So a long time ago, according to the ancient Mayans, there was no sun and no moon. Can you imagine a world with no sun and no moon? That'd be really interesting, huh? Be really cold and I don't know, be really uninteresting without a moon in the sky, but there's lots of other stuff to look at. So there were these two twins, they were called the hero twins. And the hero twins got very good at playing this particular ball game. They love to play it every day. They got really, really good at it. They played it uh, every day with each other. Um, and they were one of the best in the world. Now the hero twins soon learned that their father had been taken to the underworld the, by the Lords of the Underworld or the Zibalba. That's the name of the underworld, Zibalba. Um, and so they decided to rescue their father. So they challenged the Lords of the Underworld to a series of trials. And they passed each trial, they went on many adventures and they won and they eventually had to play this ball game that they just happened to be so particularly good at with the Lords of the Underworld. So because they were so good, they triumphed, they won the ball game, they defeated the Lords of the Underworld and were able to bring their father back from Zibalba or the Underworld. Now at that time, when they, be, when they rescued their father, they became the sun and the moon. Zibalanke, one of the hero twins, became the moon. And Hunapu, the other twin, became the sun. So that is, according to the ancient Mayans, how the sun and the moon were created. The hero twins became the sun and the moon. And so when you see an eclipse, like we saw earlier in the show, that's the hero twins saying hi to each other. When uh, Zibal and Kei wants to say hi to Hunapu, it's a solar eclipse. And when Hunapu wants to say hi uh, to Zibal and Kei, that's a lunar eclipse. That's how they say hi to each other. Now, this is what the summer sky looks like, but let's take a look at what the winter sky looks like as well. So let's skip ahead to December. There we go. Take a look at this. A lot of stuff going on here. No, oh, I think it's over here. Yeah, great. So take a look at these stars. Let's go ahead and zoom in on those. Like how many stars do you see there? Think about that. Like from further away, you don't see all that many. That's too far, it's way too far. Maybe, maybe see seven if you have really good eyesight. But if you look closer, there's dozens of stars in this area, dozens and dozens. Like, I, it would be pretty hard to count. Now, according to the ancient Greeks, that is um, seven sisters. According to the ancient Celts in Ireland, that's called uh, the Grolachen, or four lakes. And to the ancient Mayans, that's 400 boys. Now again, they didn't have any special equipment. They didn't have telescopes or anything like that. They didn't even have what sailors would use to help them navigate. So this is all observational. They could maybe only see seven of these stars. So why, why would they think that there's 400? It's pretty interesting, huh? Now there's a story about this. Like I said, seven sisters to the ancient Greeks. Um, Hang on, I think my computer froze. Let me see what's happening here. Oh no. Marissa, can you still hear me? 
I sure can. Would you like me to share my screen? Yeah. Um, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and just zoom in on this part. I mean, I really, like, if they're just seeing the uh, Pleiades, that's fine, because I don't really need to point out too much. Um, um, I believe all I am seeing is a blank screen. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you mind uh, unsharing your screen first so then I can share mine? I, I can't do anything. I'm completely frozen. Um, Goodness gracious. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, anyway, I'll tell you the story, see if uh, something resolves. Sounds really good. Clear. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, according to the ancient Mayans, that was 400 boys. And the 400 boys, they wanted to build houses for all of their families. Now, they hired this crocodile called Zipakna to, to, to build this big, deep hole, dig this deep, deep hole so that they could put a big pillar and build all of these houses. That's what Zipakna did. Um, and they promised to pay Zipakna. Now, the boys did not necessarily want to pay Zipakna for his hard work. Um, so they decided to bury Zipakna once he was finished digging the hole. Now Zipakna actually overheard their plan and he dug a side hole for himself so that he would survive. The boys did not know that Zipakna had survived. So once they put the big pillar in the hole and buried it, Zipakna started to eat away at the foundation and all the houses broke and collapsed. So the moral of the story is always do your chores. And if you're gonna hire a crocodile, always pay the crocodile after. Um, yeah, so I think I'm gonna have to, unfortunately- I'm, I'm gonna... sharing my screen now, Adrian. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly point out those Pleiades again so folks can get a good look at them. Great. There we are. Um, so let's see. Yeah, I can't do anything. Um, so uh, Marissa, can you show us yeah. Scorpio again? Absolutely. Great. Okay, so- I'm going to do the quick thing and just type it in. Sure. Scorpius. So remember that the ancient Greeks saw it as a scorpion. Uh, the Polynesians, remember from Moana, they saw it as Maui's fish hook. To the ancient Mayans, it was also a scorpion. So remember how Marissa <laughs> said, sometimes different cultures see the same thing? Well, the Mayans also saw Scorpio as a scorpion. It's a little different, it's upside down. Its tail is where we think of Scorpio's head as being. Um, but aside from that, they saw it as a scorpion, which is pretty neat. Um, do you have a time check, Marissa? Yeah, uh, we are at 1.33, so we can do about five more minutes. Folks, if you have any more questions, now's a great time to throw those into the comments uh, and we can answer questions. Yeah. Um, no, go ahead and take a look at Orion. Yeah, that will be the whole other part of the sky, right? So Orion's These are belt. two constellations. Show them uh, Orion's belt. To the ancient Mayans, that is a turtle. Yeah, that's right, a turtle. The three stars that make up Orion's belt to the ancient Mayans, they were a turtle, which is pretty nifty. Um, and then if you go, you can uh, help me out with this. So you know how the Absolutely. Orion's belt slo uh, slopes downward, Marissa? Yeah, right down like this. Yeah, so the bottom left-hand one is- Right here? Um, well, I don't know, I can't see it, but like it's, if it's the bottom okay. left one, it's right. Um, so that is part of what they call the hearthstones. So if you also go to uh, Orion's feet, those are the other two hearthstones. See how that makes up a triangle? I see, yeah. Yeah, so that- So one of those is the star Rigel, right? That we would call Rigel? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, which is the one of the brighter ones in Orion, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
So yeah, those make up the hearthstones. And if you look in the center of that, there's something that we call a nebula. And the ancient Mayans believed that this spot in particular was a place of creation. And I think that's pretty cool because nebula like this one in the middle of those three hearthstones is a place of creation. This type of nebula is a place where stars and systems like the solar system, systems of planets and asteroids and other things and comets are made. They're made in nebula like this in the middle of these hearthstones. Now, maybe the Mayans just got lucky. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but I still think it's pretty cool that they thought it was a place of creation because it is a place of creation. Hey, Adrian. So right now I'm zoomed in on this nebula so we can see it. And it looks pretty cool. There's a lot of different colors and stuff going around in there. Um, do you want to explain really quick what it is we're seeing? What are these, these clouds? Um, so yeah, they are gases. They're gases in space, large collections of gases in space, way bigger than our sun, way bigger than our solar system. And the colors can indicate the different types of gas. One of them is sometimes helium. Another one is hydrogen. Helium, you remember you put in balloons, it makes them float. Hydrogen is a very dangerous gas. You can light it on fire. <laughs> you don't want to breathe it in. It's not good. It's not fun. Um, but those are mainly what make up stars. Those gases collect enough stuff, enough mass as we call it, and they can become stars. And the stuff around them starts collecting stuff, the dust becomes planets, the other gases can become gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter. Those are both gas giants, they're planets made of gas. Uh, and that's how that works. Yeah, something I want to jump in really quick to say is that um, this nebula that Adrian was just talking about right here in Orion is something that you can see with the naked eye. Um, so Orion is a constellation out in the wintertime. Um, if you're up in the winter, out in the wintertime, and you find Orion's belt, and then you look underneath for those three stars in a row there, um, the middle one is that nebula, not just a star. Hmm, yeah. Um... And speaking of creation, how much time do I have, Marissa? Uh, just a few minutes left. Okay. Yeah, about I think three. Time. Let's talk about how the Mayans uh, thought the world and them were created. So all of the gods got together. There was a one-legged god of wind called Hurikan, Hurikan. And that's how we get our name for hurricane, by the way. Hurricane comes from the word Hurikan. Oh. Um, you know, because it's a big windstorm, god of wind, Horikan. And then uh, Venus was associated with a god called Kukulakan. So Kukulakan, Horikan was there. They all got together and they were going to build these beings that worship them. First, they made people out of mud. Now, as you might expect, the mud people didn't stay together. They fell apart. They couldn't worship the gods. That was their first attempt at making humans. Their second attempt is they made people out of wood. But the wood people didn't have souls. They couldn't worship the gods. That was uh, their second attempt at humanity. Didn't work out. Now the third attempt, they made people out of corn. Now, this is what the Mayans believed that they were. They believed that they were made out of corn. Now think about that. Why would the Mayans believe that they were made out of corn? It's kind of weird to think about, huh? But what was it that you think that they ate it, ate primarily? Probably corn. Yeah, they ate a lot of corn. So they believed they were made out of corn because they had to eat it so much. And that is how the Mayans believed the world and their entire civilization was created. They were the corn people. Um, so that is uh, how they believed their, their world was created. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's a great story. Now yeah. we are just about out of time. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Cool. There we go. Um, and I think, oh, I think it thinks you're still sharing your screen. That's okay. Thank you all so much for joining us. Technical difficulties and all. I know I had a lot of fun. Adrian, did you have fun? Yes, I had fun. Wonderful. Um, have a great rest of your day, folks. If you liked this a lot, there's a lot more curiosity at home stuff on the Pacific Science Center website. So go ahead and check it out. There's a lot of older shows um, from the past few weeks that we've done, planetarium shows. 
Um, other than that, have a great rest of your day. Stay curious. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for coming.